right, welcome to this conversation on my friend Alejandro's book, A Decolonial Philosophy of Indigenous Colombia, Time, Beauty and Spirit in Kamsha Culture. It was just recently came out a few months ago. We're here to talk to get more in depth on it. And I just wanna start by saying it's really good to see you, right? Like this has been a long time coming, you know? Yeah, yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Darian, for uh, this special invitation. I'm very happy to be here to give you, you know, a conversation, a friendly conversation, I would say, because right. we've been talking a lot uh, on, on these uh, issues. And also uh, I met Darian uh, uh, like 10 years ago now, and we've been friends since then. And also he has come here to Colombia and he knows a lot about uh, the struggles of the indigenous communities here in Colombia too. Oh, I'm glad that I'm official expert in them now. That's something else <laughs> I'll add. And so um, I want to start by kind of because your book has a personal element to it. And we talked before about this book is called a decolonial philosophy. And so I think in our conversations, definitely I, I believe that this approach that you you chose for the book fits on how you see it as decolonizing right um, i'm very interested when i read i see you reference just like my grandfather or the mm -hmm. elders in my community said this mm -hmm. and i wonder how was that process of writing and putting yourself in there and how does that relate to questions of authority and how books should be written right mm -hmm. because i'm sure the the weight of your elders' voices or your grandfather's story is kind of juxtaposed with these citations with different kinds of scholars and philosophers at different times. Mm -hmm. So I wonder how did how did you see that process? How did that process evolve? And how did you see it relating to how we might change how books are written, especially for people who want to, from different you know cultures that are more marginalized, want to speak on these issues. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, uh, it is started in in the U.S. when I was doing my Ph.D. in philosophy in Carbondale. Uh, I got the fortune uh, to meet a lot of people, specifically um, many of them who were interested in trying to explore a different ways of doing philosophy. So, um, but my impression was that many, many of the ways that people might refer to native kinds of doing philosophy were uh, made specifically by white scholars. Um, and that struck me uh, because it looked, it sounded to me as if uh, we have not reflected carefully on our own experiences and uh, and I'm put into, you know, the more academic way, way of describing them. It's not that we don't have them. It's just that we have, uh, we have had those experiences and we have doing our own way, uh, our philosophical thinking, but we haven't expressed them in the books that uh, normally we would share in the academy. So my, my first impression was that we, we probably might need to be engaged more carefully in our own conversations and start a tradition where uh, our ideas, our thoughts, our impressions, our sense of beauty of time uh, will, be taught, will be put into conversation with different traditions too. So that is how it started. And so when I wanted to do the research on my culture, obviously I took... Um, some of the research uh, that, ha that has been done um, with other people, but also I wanted to include those impressions that I learned from my grandfather, from my father, those stories that I heard when I was a child and that had a lot of impression on me. And when, when I compared those stories with all the different kinds of stories that people have about time, about the space, about the meaning of uh, existence, about the, the meaning of, of someone who is related to the land, those kind of stories uh, sounded to me that are legitimate to be included in a book where we wanted to take into account the philosophical aspects of a culture. Mm -hmm. Mm. But you didn't do an IRB. How'd you get away with that, right? Isn't that a problem? Like, you didn't do an IRB, right? You violated uh, those people's, your, your own people's sense of knowledge, right? You needed to get institutional authority to be able to talk to your own people, didn't you? 
No. Well, that's that's a good that's a good question. I, I guess I believe mm -hmm. uh, uh, it, it in some circles it might sound as if I'm um, not taking fully into account that the experience of telling a story uh, is uh, actually in the context and in the specific context. So if I change the context, so for example, if I'm giving an account of a story into a book, it sounds as if I'm. Uh, I'm not representing carefully what is at stake with the story. So in that in that case, uh, you know, uh, someone might say, "Well, the spirit of the community is 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 getting lost in a book that is written into a different language." So, for example, something like that. But I believe that um, we should have uh, the um, the ability to express ourselves in the way we want it. Um, and so, and I think there are many native people in the academy, and there are many uh, native or people who have some ancestors and they heard a story, and they probably don't have uh, the confidence to talk in those environments. So I wanted to do it uh, also for a political reason, because I say mm. that we need to put this into conversation, into a bigger conversation and not feel ourselves as if we are not able to have this conversation in a bigger context. So of course the book has some, some aspects of our culture, but I wanted to put it into a bigger context. In the context where in the academy specifically, it is often taken for granted that we don't we don't spend too much time in thinking because we are busy just in the jungle or we're just busy you know <laughs> you know hanging out, with, uh, hanging out with llamas and and yeah or and something movies. like that like, like we don't have like books or time to think about ourselves or something like that so hey, it was like I well, say, well i was in simondo you didn't show me a single book so well um I well to i took you into the jungle though so you didn't have <laughs> the space to be in the in my in my own room no but but it's true it's that in many in many very many cases you will see that it's often just taken for granted that uh i i do remember when when i was uh talking with a friend not with you but another friend who told me once well uh, how what are you telling me that you that your stories are still written down i will i told him well you know my mom does belts so you will see it's not in the same alphabet, in, in the same language, but still we have a written story and we share that so those stories. And probably you, you met my mom and you know how she does those belts and she, how she tells the stories when she's doing it. So it, there is a tradition that we already have there. It's just like it has not been put into the, uh, the more academic words that I put into the book, but it, it's all there. That's a very interesting point that I, I would like to kind of think about more when it comes to writing and different mm -hmm. cultures, because some of the work that I've been doing in like um, Cloud Levy Strauss and some of these other people, they make this distinction between cultures based on writing and cultures that are oral. Mm -hmm. But what you said is with your mother's belts, she does these wonderful belts that are encoded with different like symbols and images that convey stories on mm -hmm. different sides of them and people wear them to express those things and you just mm -hmm. said now that that would be considered writing mm -hmm. and so mm -hmm. i wonder what is that that's very that's, def that's definitely a different way of understanding writing and language mm -hmm. perhaps mm -hmm. than what other people might be used to in terms of their sense of there are people who focus a lot on orality and they don't have books mm -hmm. but they have images but images aren't quite writing so why would you why why would you call the belts that your mother made writing mm -hmm. well i uh, Okay, yeah. Well, I think because uh, in the process of doing uh, the belt, uh, what is happening is the crystallization of uh, thinking of, of the memory of, uh, of the people that we, we have in there, the memory of the ancestors passing down from one generation to the next becomes uh, uh, crystallizes in the, in, the, in the symbols of the belt. So each of the symbols of a belt is a story that is being told from generation through generations. Uh, but in the act of telling the story, she is also like if she were writing, you know, she is like putting into these uh, these waves and saying what's happening in there. And at the same time, the people who are around her know what she's doing. 
And she is, you know, obviously she's not interested in that, uh, putting to this, these words into a bigger audience, but just for the people who are around there. But for me, it, 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 that process of, of uh, putting down thoughts is a process of writing. So if you are using a different language, obviously you want to think about it. Why do I need to write this letter, for example? Or why do I need to respond to this paper? And when you are doing this process of thinking, well, you need to say, uh, why do you want to respond in that way? Or why do you want to choose a specific words to represent your thinking? Choose uh, a specific uh, concept or a specific a letter to indicate the point you want to emphasize. So the same, I think, is happening when someone is doing a well, specifically in my community. They have to think, why do, do, do I want it to put the, the symbol of the sun, the symbol of the mountain in here? Why do you need to pause in here and not finish the belt yet? Probably because the story has not ended yet. Probably because we need to um, do the story tomorrow. And I think that the same process is happening when you're writing a paper, when you're writing a book, or when you're writing a poem, or when you're writing a song or something like that. You know, there is a, this process of, of engagement with, with your thinking and what you're doing. And I, I, I characterize that as, a, that as a kind of writing. It's not in the same language, obviously, but, but it's, the process is the same. That's great. So you brought up something that I was going to bring up, which is you commonly have used this metaphor of crystallization, right? Mm -hmm. Like crystals, it's like I walked into a new age bookstore in your book, there's crystals everywhere, right? Mm -hmm. uh -huh. um, so can we talk about that in terms of like time and mm -hmm. storytelling, right? Mm -hmm. Time seems to have a certain kind of meaning. If you want to bring in history as well, but mm -hmm. I noticed that in the, both of them have a sense of time and in talking about in terms of history, in terms mm -hmm. of storytelling, there seems to be a certain kind of time centered in experience versus time and time centered in meaning making and community. Mm -hmm. And so how does that, how would that be understood as a concept? What is the concept of time? And how does that concept time differ from other concepts of times like those you might experience in like cities of Bogota or when you came to the United States? Mm -hmm. You, I'm sure you experience mm -hmm. time differently there, and that is what led you to reflect on talking about in terms of time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. No, that's also a very deep and great question. Uh, the question of time obviously has different philosophical approaches to it. Um, perhaps if someone is interested in, in trying to relate our a deep sense of time, which is represented through storytelling in our culture, could refer to the ways uh, of time is described either by William James or by Bergson, where they talk about the real duration, the real time, the almost the psychological time that you experience when you have a very meaningful experience. That's pretty much the, the closest uh, that I could refer to other philosophical ways of seeing time. But it's true in, in our community, we see time like in two different ways. There is the, the, the time as, you know, more in the Western kind of uh, concept of time, which is um, you know, um, a framework where, where you put different events into one perspective. So you say, this is the past, this is something that has that happened in the past, this is something in the present, this is something in the future, like in that kind of structure. And so we have also that sense of time. And we know that this is useful for some, uh, you know, for some um, uh, practical purposes. Like, uh, for example, if you want to do like, you want to um, uh, make an agreement with someone or you want to uh, establish a contract with a person or something like that, there is kind of usefulness in that, in that concept of time. But, um, and so we also tell our native story based on that concept. The problem with that, uh, with that approach is that it's very limited. And it's very limited because uh, we have to relate our experience of a people living in there based on one beginning, on one time, one specific point. And we need to build all our story based on that main point. 
And uh, what has happened with my community specifically, and this is true also for pretty much all the uh, Southwestern uh, native communities in Colombia, where we had to relate our history as if it started with the Spanish when they got there. So it's almost as if it were mandatory to start our history from that point of view. And this is not only limited, but also very, um, very problematic because we are now telling our history based on the European kind of history. And this is from our perspective, this is very, very problematic, but because it, it looks like if we were nothing before the Spanish, it's like, you know, you are only something now because the Spanish got there, got you there. Otherwise you will be like, you know, uh, pretty much uh, nothing in time or something like that. Uh, it's, it's very, 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 very problematic in that perspective. But we also use that kind of concept because we want to know about our, our um, since when we have a right to, to, to claim our land uh, legally, for example, that's useful. Time in that regard is useful. Also time, it's useful to know how much land has been taken out from the native communities. So for that regard, it also has a very practical purpose. But the most meaningful time, the most meaningful sense of time is a time that we experience in storytelling. So that happens, this is the qualitative aspect of time. And it has to do with uh, the experience that you feel when you hear a story in, you know, in a fire, close by the fire, surrounded by people, having drinks, over there and uh, sharing what what was your deep question like what is what is life and where are we going and what's the meaning of death um, what happens when someone's memory is lost so that, those kind of uh, uh, you know deep questions of human life get resolved through storytelling and get resolved or at least get into conversation with storytelling. So when you when you have the storytelling, you have the experience of time where it doesn't really matter how much, you know, uh, it, it doesn't really ma ma matter the clock time. It doesn't really matter whether you spend like hours or days just, just talking there, sitting down there, just trying to see what's going on with that, hearing a story from the ancestors, say, uh, trying to understand what they could mean, you know, by the use of a specific word or by the use of a specific image. Um, that kind of meaningful experience of time is the most significant for us. And uh, the reason why this is the most significant, it is because there we relate ourselves to our ancestors at the same uh, uh, at the same time as with the present. So we we feel as if the ancestors were present in the moment of telling a story, and we also feel a sense of responsibility about how to use our stories for the next generation. We feel like an ethical responsibility to say that the stories that we have are sacred, but not in the sense that we cannot touch them or in the sense that we cannot speak about them or something like that, but in the sense that our deepest um, uh, meaning uh, is, uh, is rooted in those kind of stories. It, it is not as if we wanted to maintain the same kind of stories because you probably wanted to change something in the story or an, an elder will want it to change something in the story, but the person who wants to change it has to feel the responsibility that is changing the future of the community. And that kind of sense of responsibility only happens around the fire, remembering what our ancestors, our ancestors um, having told have told us before and also uh, taking into account that the new generation will be will based uh, on that story will be based on that story you know that's that's why this more um, uh, deep this deepest sense of meaning no meaningful time is more valuable in our community than the other 
uh, sense of time. The other sense of time is useful and we know it's useful, but it is not the same as what we have in the, in the, in the kind of community storytelling uh, experience of time. So if you wanted to summarize this a little bit would be like, well, in the storytelling, you have the qualitative aspect of time over the quantitative aspect. In the other usefulness of time, you have a strong sense of the quantitative over the qualitative time. And uh, it could change. So for example, you asked me about well, how was your experience there in the United States? So most mostly, and I understand why, why this is, you know, a big country has to function or functions pretty much when you have an arrangement of you have to do it, you know, the trains have to arrive at a certain hour and to depart at a certain hour. Otherwise, just a chaotic environment. So, but I uh, that's not problematic in itself. It's just like when you think that this is the only way that you can experience time, then it's when you are losing something really meaningful with the relation with other people and with the relation with yourself and with the rest of the environment. So, for example, if you wanna if you wanna have uh, one afternoon just walking um, on the street trying to see, just just trying to be yourself, walking and thinking about yourself, you don't have to be worried that you have to be a certain point or to just be there. Uh, you know, there is a very, very interesting, I think, qualitative aspect uh, that is lost when you emphasize a lot only the quantitative aspect of time. And I think in the, in the I will go ahead, see, sorry, sorry. No, 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 I, I, you've said a lot of like really interesting things. And I do think that part of one of the problems of our, this contemporary global system as run by your modernity, speaking of countries like mm -hmm. Europe and America and how those institutions are spread around the world, there is also this sense of very particular notions of time. And I see like all over just people are anxious, mm -hmm. very anxious. I mean, we've mm -hmm. had lots of discussions about our anxieties in different systems or things like that. But hearing you talk about it now, there's very much sense that a lot of our anxieties people face is that they don't have enough time, mm -hmm. time in a meaningful, in a meaningful sense to expand themselves. I've been having so many conversations with people over the past couple of weeks where people are telling me a lot about themselves. And I keep telling people, hey, you need to slow down. Like you need to give yourself time to unfold and understand the things that are happening to you. Mm -hmm. And so it, your question has me wondering, one, how has your, this discussion of time, how is that related to kind of how you or other people have been experiencing this pandemic? Because it definitely mm -hmm. ruptured a sense of time, a different mm -hmm. senses of time. And I'm also wondering how might we, how might people construct institutions or spaces that are more based around this qual these qualitative aspects of time, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, well, that's. Uh, I will start with the easy question. I will put aside the the more difficult one. No, just kidding. Um, I'm trying to embarrass you, man. Yeah, yeah, no, you you pushing me a lot there. Um, uh, well, uh, for the pandemic, I guess um, there is definitely a rupture of the sense of identity and culture and time, specifically that you are sharing um, with other people. So I think, but this is, uh, I, I would put some, uh, you know, sociological or political viewpoint here, which is that this is, um, this is much more difficult uh, in those cases where people didn't have uh, uh, um, a job security or didn't have the opportunities to be at home. So for the people who didn't have the chances to be at home to, you know, uh, to, to just be by themselves because they had to work a lot, I think for them it was much more difficult to see, you know, the disadvantage uh, in our societies where, um, you know, the, all, almost the, the poor and the, and, and the people who had to work for, for other people had to put their lives at risk also their family at risk in, in the pandemic, during the pandemic, 
But in, in my case, now I, I have the fortune to be working in a university. So I was pretty much, you know, just at home. So in my case, personally, my experience was that uh, initially it was challenging, but then I had a lot of time to reflect about why I'm doing some kind of stuff. Like, for example, why, I'm, why I need to spend a lot of my time to, you know, just watch the news or stay in the news, getting anxious about when is this going to go over and what happened with our lives or something like that. But um, then I, I was trying to reflect more carefully about um, our collective responsibility, specifically here in Colombia, to be more vocal to uh, in the public spaces, in the public um, arena, and tell them that this is a, this is a collective responsibility. This is not just people who have to divide themselves and see who is going to save us or something like that. But also, this is something that we need to have a bigger conversation about. Uh, what kind of of health system do we want to have? What kind of social responsibility we should have? So I was much more engaged in those conversations uh, uh, after at least half of the pandemic with some friends. So that's uh, that was my experience of the, during the pandemic. But the other question about uh, how the social institutions uh, create, uh, you know, buildings or or programs based on ideas more on on the space than on the qualitative aspect of time and the kind of anxieties that people have in the modern capitalist societies. Uh, it, I think it's much more problematic when 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 specifically when the people in power uh, strongly emphasize that, you know, it, it doesn't really matter, um, um, like if you have to work a lot and you have to work hard, as long as you one day will have this kind of building or this kind of apartment or this kind of house where you will be happy one day. I think the, there, is, uh, there is this, uh, not only this homogenization of culture there, but also the homogenization of the experiences that they want us to have. So for example, I just want to relate this. Um, uh, uh, not in my community, but in other native communities in the southwest of Colombia, in the southeast of Colombia too, uh, there is the sense that uh, the way you, you build your house also tells you uh, the way you relate to your environment. So if you build a house when you have your main rooms like just squares or just like, you know, just like a place where nobody wants, wanted, when you don't want to be seen by anybody, um, that uh, shows a closure of your space and also it could show a closure of your experiences. But if you leave your space more open when you are constructing a house, when you have more windows or you may have more openness to the rest, you all, your experience is also an openness to the rest of the world, to the rest of the environment. And that means that your idea of trust in other people uh, could improve. The idea that you could have uh, more experience with other people could improve. The idea you wanted to be a person who, who is... Um, uh, who feels that um, it is much more interesting in human life to share and to give time to other people more than to trying to restrict them or to trying to say that I'm the only important person here and I don't want you to be here or something like that. So I think there is, there is like the, the sense of op openness and the sense of closure. Uh, in in the way we construct the buildings and the way in the way we organize our spaces, so because our spaces uh, could represent how we wanted to relate with other people. So you have you know huge buildings and you don't know the person who lives in the in the ten uh, floor. You don't doesn't know the person who lives in the first floor. Uh, that's pretty much like a, a, a relation of strangeness or alienation of the human community. Um, that maybe it has to work for for urban development or something like that. But I think we should question about what it means urban development. It's just like uh, you know making buildings and houses and and a jungle of of, of bricks. That's what it means that human development, or it is more what it should mean human development, which means like well, why would do we talk together more often? Why is this rush of accumulation of properties? 
uh, wh why is that uh, urgency in, in human life? Uh, where are we going with all of that? I think that it's a deep philosophical question in that in that sense. And, uh, and I think, um, you know, public officials should be more engaged with, you know, the kind of a spiritual, uh, I don't know if the word is, is that, what the kind of sense that makes life more meaningful, more interesting. Um, unless uh, with the urgency that you have to be successful and the urgency you have to have a lot of money in order to be happy or something like that. I don't know. That's that's my sense. But uh, I think that's a, a very deep question that you ask. <laughs> Great. So I heard a like, couple of really interesting things. One, the notion of that I think really solidifies what you were talking about storytelling. But even some of the differences in notion of history is time as something that's shared that in sharing time, it becomes meaningful. And that part of the problem of our, of this sense of life that is spreading around the globe, as you call it, homogenizing, is that there isn't a much, there isn't a much space or emphasis for time being shared between people. And that manifests in how we live our lives and the very spaces that we can, that we inhabit, right? Don't mm -hmm. create good opportunities for sharing time with people. Mm -hmm. And so moving away from time to space, I want to talk about the different concepts of land and mm -hmm. um, and the buscanate, this kind mm -hmm. of ritual ceremonial dance, and the appreciation of um, the beauty of nature, but also, more importantly, participation with nature. Mm -hmm. And to me, that also is a different form of time, mm -hmm. right? But and it's also a different notion of space. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I want to know how do you, how from the, what are the most potent philosophical concepts relating to uh, space and time and nature as something that we participate with or connect to? Mm -hmm. And how might that be, what, what, are, what are something that other people around the world might be able to take away from those notions? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, the last part, I, I don't think I would be able to answer fully. I, I'll try it. But the other part, yes. Mm -hmm. so, um, so um, we have two different concepts to relate to space. One is chance. This could be like the physical space, like, uh, you know, the, the place, the like the kind of place where you put a mark and you say, well, this is my property or something like that. This is the kind of chance. Uh, the sense where you say here here is the border and from here to the next border is someone else's or this uh, or this is this is you know a mark to indicate that the the department or the or the village there, this is where the village ends and from here we start a new village something like that so this is the kind of the physical representation of space that uh, that we call it shanks and there is an also a different um, representation of space, which we call uh, Tsvatsana Mama. Tsvatsana Mama, it's a, it's a more powerful way of describing space because there we are not talking about just the physical space, but we're talking about uh, the meaning that a specific space has to a people or to a person. It's like a home. Uh, so you, you say I have a house or you have a home, it's different. You know, when you say a home, you're trying to refer to the kind of qualitative relationships that you have developed in a specific environment. So when we call Tsubatsana Mama the space, which is the, all the, not only the land that we have, but also all the, all the, all the symbolic meanings that we have created uh, out of our land, this is the this is the symbolic space, or this is the Tsvatsana Mama. And in this space, because we, this is like home for us, we relate uh, with, uh, we have uh, the sense of relationship in, in that kind of space. And we don't think land in the sense of Tsvatsana Mama is just a commodity to be exploited. It just, it, it is not just an object at our disposal to see what we wanted to do. 
Okay, so Tsubatana Moma uh, has a more um, strong connotation to our 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 uh, to the meaning of life. I would put it that way, um, and this means that uh, not only the, not only the land or the representation of Tsubatana Moma is for um, for trying to understand that. Um, it has a meaning uh, beyond the physical space. Uh, and that you could you could explain it to say by by indicating that when you when you refer to the land as your mother, you are trying to say that this is a strong sense that you have to take care of, of her. But also uh, Mother Earth has given you uh, nutrition. Uh, your nutrition, your health depends on your mother, and it has also depended, you know, in the in the more um, you know colloquial way, we say that without our mother, we cannot live longer or live carefully. Or our specifically uh, early childhood, we depend on other people. That sense of dependence, we also keep maintaining the sense of dependence through our land. To make uh, a sense of uh, of a whole uh, history of the community, so we we it, this is common in a lot of cultures in Colombia that we are nothing without the land. With the land, in the sense of Tsubatana Mama, in the sense of in the sense of um, the collective way of addressing space, uh, also it has uh, a sense of participation because it means that um, if you if you understand that. Uh, you know the the forest or 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 um, the animals that you have uh, in your environment. You don't want to kill all of them. And you want to destroy all of that. Uh, and so it doesn't matter. It's sometimes the land or or or, or the the place where you have is not uh, you know productive, because productive is also some kind of sense that I need to use it. Uh, of course, we use the land. Of course, we use the resources that we 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 have from the the natural space, but it it, it is just not for exploitation or for accumulation. For example, uh, we use what we have to use, and we also uh, reciprocate or give back to the land what it deserves. And sometimes we need to just protect some uh, you know uh, resources like. Uh, like species or like, you know, um, um, whether it could be some kind of vegetables that we wanted to maintain there because it is beautiful to the sense of the environment or some flowers that we use to the question that you were referring to, to our biggest ceremony or the biggest uh, expression, the, the best expression that in my, in my view, the best expression that we have to get, to get all this together to the sense of time, the space and the sense of beauty is in, is in, a, in a celebration that we have, that we celebrated each year. It's called the Pitsknate or the biggest or the best uh, of our base, you know, the big and the best there goes together. It has a sense of beauty and also the sense of uh, of moral power or the goodness or something that really, really good there. That's what we call the best of uh, the Pitsknate, the best or the, the biggest of our base, the more sacred day. And in that celebration of this carnival, uh, it all the of the um, of the all the sense of participation with the natural environment comes also into the dancing. So, for example, there is a specific kind of flower that we throw on people's head to uh, let them let them remember um, that they had to maintain this sense of participation in the community. Uh, and this kind of flower is only specific to the to the to the uh, to the community, and we call this flower Claire Strange. And what is interesting here is that um, this uh, name of the flower uh, has a suffix which is also related to the kind of sense of illumination, awakening, uh, with a sense of oh, we are new again or renewal or something like that. So we have you, Claire Strange. We say uh, binge, binge is the sun. Clear Strange is a flower, Bovinch is the blood of the people. So we have the same kind of root 
in the in the in the in this particular flower and this means that there is a relation uh, and all all the all the words and we we, we say inj nin for, for example nin is the is the wood that we use for making fire so all of that has a sense of illumination awakening like the sun is you know illumination awakening the our our blood all of the sense, sense of life. And when we have this kind of denomination for the flowers and also the kind of flower to throw in the people's head to remember our history, I think there is a lot of relationship in there going on in this carnival, in this in this dance, in this participation. We were mentioning like, you know, what is what you know what we might be losing when we lose those kind of experiences and um, when we do not take into account that this is uh, a human participation in a, sen a bigger sense of life, in a, in a strong way of, of trying to understand ourselves, not as isolated creatures, but creatures who share and uh, whose sense of, of sharing uh, is not dependent on how much you want to receive, but it is based on the sense that I need to reciprocate because uh, this uh, huge better uh, space is is something that I, I uh, that I have a deep a deep respect to to the Tsvatsina Mama. That's why we call it the Mother Earth, and in a lot of native communities, uh, this is this is very very similar. Uh, many native communities in the Americas call the Earth our mother. Uh, for for the for the run, for the reasons that I've explained, but also for for the reasons that we feel in that way, we we feel that we don't need to destroy all the environment to just uh, have a lot of profitable resources. We also need to 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 have a sense that. It is, it is beautiful to see the water clean. It is beautiful to see uh, a lot of flowers in, in our, in our um, backyard. It is also beautiful to, to try to tell to the next generation that you know, uh, we are not the owners of this land. We are just people who participate in the land. And so there will be more people who come later and to have the, sense, the same sense of participation in the land. Uh, and we wanted to be buried in the land and to from our bodies to create the other senses of, of continuity to through history. So that's why uh, there is a, a, this deep sense of, of um, the place of specifically the Tsubatsana Mama. I didn't develop all of that in the book, but I mentioned a lot of that specifically in the in the in the chapter on Butsknate on the celebration. But I'm trying to think more carefully now about what is the meaning, why people want to have this kind of sense of uh, of um, of symbolic space, not only space in the physical sense, but why why it is important also to have this symbolic sense of space. Um, I, I think uh, I don't know if I forgot to answer the question, but uh, but uh, no, you did, you did great. Uh, the question, the other question was, how might this notion be useful to people around the world? But mm -hmm. we can move on to a different question. Mm -hmm. I'd rather do that mm -hmm. because you've said a lot here already. So uh, just to clarify some of the strongest themes I noticed, one is that once again the notion of sharing has emerged mm -hmm. again. Time is mm -hmm. shared, but now you're saying that space is shared, mm -hmm. not just between people, but with all the other things that occupy that space mm -hmm. and the means by which we share that space and navigate that shared space constitutes the kind of, the crystallization of that mm -hmm. is mm -hmm. the shared notion of space that makes it mm -hmm. meaningful and makes life worth mm -hmm. living. And as you also explained, appreciation of nature, beauty, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. is something that is essential to life and mm -hmm. living and the value mm -hmm. of wanting to live. Mm -hmm. And the reason why the best day, the Buscanate, involves an, an aesthetic appreciation of land mm -hmm. is that that aesthetic appreciation is, is a kind of reminding of our contextualized value, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And our... And that appreciating land for its beauty does represent a counterpoint to the kind of utilitarian, profit-driven mm -hmm. 
productivity based notion of relationship to land, which mm -hmm. has kind of led to notions such as conservation mm -hmm. and in the US, but other places, national parks. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So for me, I see that there is a, a lot useful to understanding how some of the very anxieties and frustrations mm -hmm. people are experiencing in terms of time, not having enough time mm -hmm. or not having enough, and or feeling like what, what is my future going to hold, seem mm -hmm. to be directly tied to how we occupy space as well, because mm -hmm. you have to make time to under to be able to truly appreciate what you need to appreciate. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, yeah. I think well, you're you're making a really good point here, which is like um, the relation between space and time. You know, that's a very uh, a very philosophical question. Like what mm -hmm. what what is uh, where we emphasize more, and and I think um, in our specific case, there is this harmony between the two. There is not like we need to emphasize one over the other. The, actually, they are working pretty much together. It's just like for the reasons of clarifications or explanation, we might probably sometimes emphasize one more over the other. But you're definitely right. You know, people who um, don't experience uh, or who feel anxious about uh, where I'm going, what's happening with my life or something like that. Probably people who don't have a, a good place uh, to start with. And also people who probably don't have uh, a good place probably might feel a lot of pressure to have a space or to have some somewhere uh, to go. Uh, you know, and, and I think um, in the specific uh, sense of appreciation of time and space in the community. Uh, we, with this celebration, what we are actually doing is like um, trying to uh, feel ourselves as part of the community, but feel it not with with the sense, uh, you know, I'm not saying, I'm not denying actually, that we are not saying that, well, it is so beautiful to be the community. No, well, of course we understand that the community has been colonized by the Spanish people and we make fun of them too in the in the dancing. You know, we make fun of the, of the earlier conquistadors and we also find, make fun of the priests but it was ironic with the dancing is that while uh, we have uh, a Catholic mass during the dancing too. So this all, all of that is, is pretty, pretty funny because there is one character who represents the, the bishop and it has with you know with with the with all, all, all the clothing that normally a bishop uses. But that person, that character who is dancing in the carnival. Uh, you know, it's it's also someone there, and we make fun of that person. Uh, it's, it's just a representation, obviously. It's not like, but all of that is there, and so and and the sense. Uh, I think there is also a strong sense there of forgiveness about what happened. Not because we have forgotten, not because we say, "Oh, that is good that the Spanish came here." No, we all we all remember what happened in there. Yeah, but in that specific day, we decide also. Also to make fun of the Spanish, also to make fun of the priests, also to make fun of, the, of everybody else, and also to forgive each other for whatever we were doing. So there is this kind of uh, sense of appreciation what we got there, fully aware of, uh, of the pains, the sufferings, but also the possibilities of enjoyment and, and, and uh, with also the possibilities that this is not over, that we are still here dancing in circles, uh, sharing with other people, and hopefully to meet the next year again with much more strong sense of here we are again, or dance again. Uh, we are here again with new friends, probably you should go there next year uh, and to say, hey, Darian is here to, the, to dance this year, something like that. You <laughs> know, we want, we, we, want to, we want to expand this kind of sharing and enjoyment because we know this is a human need to, to feel somehow this kind of, uh, not this kind of beauty for, for representation, but to feel it, to be in there. Um, that's why I think I, I probably love a lot the kind of, you know, dancing to be with the community because you don't feel uh, uh, judgmental. Uh, nobody's going to judge you. Uh, everybody's dancing. Everybody's drinking. And also everybody asking forgiveness. Oh, sorry for, for something that probably I, I, 
I make fun of you one day, but it's fine. Here, you can make fun of me too, something like that. You know, this sense of humor, appreciation, that's all of that. And I, that's why uh, I, I, I prefer to call it, this is an aesthetic experience of the community trying to make sense of what it means to, to feel beautiful uh, in, in the community. Also, this is probably the first, um, the, one of the day when you actually worry about what you want to dress and you want it to dress beautiful, <laughs> you know, normally you, you, you know me, uh, normally I don't care too much about what, what I'm dressing, but, uh, yeah. but well, you, you see in the, in the, in the picture here, but right now, that, yeah, yeah, I know. Yeah, I know. I know. Right? <laughs> I know. This, this, this is what we got here, you know, <laughs> but, but in that day, you actually wanted to be to feel yourself beautiful. And in order to do that, you wear a crown. It's how you call right? Yeah, uh, crown, with yeah. all yeah, with all the belts uh, closing by down, and all of that is. You remember, like, oh, this is my mom did that, and oh wow, I, I feel it. Uh, you know, talking in my own language with people from a long time. Uh, I'm talking with the elders in your language. It feels a lot beautiful. It, it, it has, and they also dance. So it's not like just you're dancing and a lot of people are watching you. It's like all, all of them are dancing around and you met with, you know, elders and they are dancing with you. They hug you and say, oh, that's so nice in our language. It's so nice that we share together. Hopefully we continue with this. And this is, it has this powerful sense of community, of, of identity, and also of forgiveness and, and, and the possibility of continuing to enjoy this kind of experience. So I think that is also something that I wanted to put into words because sometimes people describe native communities only with the, um, uh, with the sufferings, with the, all of discrimination that we face, which is true also. I'm not saying that it doesn't happen, that all the time happens. But that kind of empowerment that we have in the community makes us feel like, well, this is not all that we have. We also have that kind of sense and gives us some sense of pride for whatever we have there. So yeah, so to so wrap up this section, you've definitely made a link between beauty, value, appreciation, mm -hmm. and land. And also, and now I see the link between a forgiveness. Mm -hmm. You can't really appreciate someone fully or your own life fully if you can't appreciate if you're if you're if you if you're blocked by certain kinds of wrongdoings or you have a certain kind of negative attitude towards mm -hmm. other people or the world, you can't fully appreciate your own life. Mm -hmm. And there's a sense that forgiveness has some type of relation to the aesthetic dimension. Something I never really thought about, but that mm -hmm. in this conversation and in reading your book has mm -hmm. kind of come out that being able to forgive is part of the condition to be able to understand someone and appreciate them and perhaps even the world around you appreciate mm -hmm. its value and its beauty and its meaning to you. And so mm -hmm. with that, we'll move to the final section, which is called spirit. Mm -hmm. And spirit deals a lot with ritual surrounding Yahe, mm -hmm. which is commonly known in the United States as ayahuasca. And mm -hmm. it's a Minnesota plant that's used for healing and spiritual development, and it grants all kinds of visions and possibilities for connection and, and self-realization. So how do you see, how, how do you understand spirit then being in relation to space and time, and how does Yahe and the Yahe ritual ceremonies relate to that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, well, I, uh, when I was thinking about writing that chapter, uh, I refer a lot to the experience that I have from grand my grandfather. Uh, and um, I decided uh, it would be useful to tell people why I, I wrote that chapter. And one of the things that I mentioned in the, at the beginning of the book is that it was very difficult to me for, for me to, uh, to write about my culture without uh, trying to relate some of my personal experiences. So I want to just briefly mention one of them, which I think uh, will give me more ideas to, to, to tell about the Yahé or the Ayahuasca experiences. I'm also happy to talk about the one that we did together. Oh, sure, definitely. Yeah, 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 yeah. That would be, that would be really nice. Yeah. So uh, 
I remember when I was in high school, or when I was about, you know, nine, 10 grade, I really was really interested in math and physics and chemistry. And part of the reason why I was so interested in that was because um, uh, I felt in those, in those fields of knowledge, nobody will discriminate me uh, because I was native. Uh, because, you know, the answers in those kind of fields uh, are, of, you know, in the, in the classical sense, objective, or it doesn't depend on who, you're, who is saying. So you have to wow, demonstrate, yeah. demonstrate something in logic or in mathematical or in physics. Well, it doesn't depend on who you are. If nobody wants to agree with you, well, sorry for them, something like that. So I, I, I give, it gave me that sense to me, and I was very good at that in, in, in high school. Uh, so, uh, so I was a lot, and, and I had a good teacher in, 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 in physics and in chemistry, and he was explaining one time that uh, the world is made of atoms and a lot of, uh, you know, chemical reactions. And then we, if we find the formula to understand what is, the, what is the, the world made of, ultimately, we will explain everything. I was like, wow, that's a really deep thought. And at the same time, uh, my grandfather, by the time, was alive. He died in 2010. But when I was in high school, my grandfather uh, used to heal us when we were sick. And my grandfather used to practice, you know, this native kind of medicine where uh, I know it was effective to me and it was affecting a very strange way, I would put it that way. Because sometimes I was just normally working with my dad in the farm and suddenly I would get sick and I didn't know why. And my grandfather, my father used to tell me, well, you need to go to the grandfather and he's going to uh, heal you. And I went, wow, that's really true. And it, it happened. And I went to there and my grandfather will heal me. And I was like, well, this probably works. But it was strange to me because I would have a lot of dreams. And I, and when I was sick, I dreamt a lot about, you know, cows and rivers, like really, uh, really um, ugly rivers trying to uh, put me down. And, and, and I have a sense of, a sense of falling down, falling down, falling down. And I asked my grandfather one time, what's the meaning of those, of those, of those dreams? And he told me, well, uh, it's a very complicated issue, but uh, that's because uh, you are possessed by spirits. And I was like, well, what, what would that mean? And, and when I asked him that, he was just smile to me back and say, well, you probably understand one day, or probably not, I don't know. But uh, see, with a jahe, you could heal. And, and from my grandfather's perspective, the world was not made of atoms and chemical energies, but with spirits. So I was living in this kind of opposite kind of environment where one was like, well, the, the world is just made of atoms and chemical reaction. And the other was saying, no, they have spirits who have a lot of power in your life. Whether you want it or not, this is how it works. And um, that's the teachings that I received from my grandfather. So one day he invited me to drink ayahuasca. And I was like, well, how it could be possible that something that is physical could cause me something spiritual? That was a very philosophical question. And I was like, well, I will try it. And I tried and make myself strong. And it, it, it didn't happen anything to me. What I see, I'm right. It didn't happen anything to me. The second time- well, the experience. Yeah, the second time I, I, I drank again, I was completely a different story to me. And since then I was like, well, probably I just didn't know before. I'm sorry I didn't know. But uh, the second time I felt something I never had experienced before, which is like, I feel a strong connection, almost like I felt um, my blood circulating, the circulation of the blood, which is normally something that you don't feel. But when I drink, I was, I felt all of that. But not only that, I also felt a lot, I had a lot of visions that day. Yeah, and that gave me, uh, you know, more to think carefully about why those visions have in that specific environment and how the cultural and the symbolic uh, way of describing my life uh, have some uh, real um, effects into my own personal life. So I decided I should keep drinking and to see what's happening. And every time since then, 
uh, I've been drinking, I always have some kind of this, this experience. And it always refers something to my personal life, whether I feel uh, alone, whether I feel uh, that I need to do something for me. And I, I learned later that this, is, this has to do with the way you prepare the ayahuasca, because if you prepare it wrongly, it could be devastating for you. So you have to have some knowledge in order to, to make the good preparation. But not only that, it, it is that you also have to have uh, almost a spiritual disposition to, to see the world different. So if you do it with, with the right attitude and you do it with the right person uh, who knows how to prepare that, it's a very remarkable experience that I decided to put in, into the book as the world of the spirit. And the world of the spirit is the world in which you, um, um, I don't know if I should say trans, trans, transcend because it's not that you leave the world but you go beyond, but you have a more, a more, um, uh, a more engaged uh, way with the world. You, you maybe, become, maybe a different, maybe a different quality of awareness. Like I think that yeah, I, I think I think that's that's probably what what's happened because you you feel something that you are in there, but also you are experiencing something and trying to make a lot of relations with relationship uh, with something that you have experienced before, but also you have the ability to understand. Uh, what what probably is going on with other people you know you have that and and that you develop some people develop it stronger than others it depends on how you have been preparing for for having that uh, the experience it's a kind of mystical experience for me and it's very difficult to describe it into you know into a normal way and and that i will um, ask you back uh, you know yeah. your experience in, in that because you had that experience too it was not with my grandfather because you know he died in 2010 but uh, it, it it was meaningful when when you also had that experience and then we talk about all of that and you were, and we're like well yeah that's that's how something like uh, i didn't want it to tell it to words and to put it to words but it's there so I don't know yeah. if, if you want to share something about your experience. Yeah, I'll be happy to share about it. You know, for me, I've always been someone who's had different kinds of spiritual gifts and abilities. And the, one of the main things that was really important about my relationship with you when I first met you and really got mm -hmm. to know you in 2012 was just that you made me feel like I was like what I was, the things I was experiencing and seeing it mm -hmm. were just like, there was this place for that. It wasn't like I was just, because I was very, very alienated from everyone around me. And I would say things that I was seeing or thinking, you'd be like, yeah, you know, I have a context for that. And so that was one of the ways that we bonded and connected and what, and how you became very meaningful to me when I was trying to figure out reality. Mm -hmm. And um, when we went down to Columbia, and when I went down to Columbia last December, and I did do go through that ceremony, yeah, there were just a lot of different experiences that occurred and I can see why it would be difficult to put them into words. But for me, one of the things that stood out the most was the quality of intersubjective reality that existed, like the kind of things that I was able to see in other people and mm -hmm. they were able to see into me was something I never really experienced before in that level of intensity. So for instance, there was a moment where I was sitting in the chair and the the person, how should I call? What should I call the person? The the elder that was leading the ceremony. The shaman, you could call shaman. him. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he and the two of the younger ones, the two of the mm -hmm. his apprentices, they kind of they sent their awareness towards me. Mm -hmm. And so one thing that happened in the ceremonies that I it was clear that I had these kinds of gifts, shamanic gifts and abilities as well. Mm -hmm. They sent their awareness towards me. And there was a young girl, so like maybe she was like 12 or something. Mm -hmm. She looked at me and she smiled and her consciousness mm -hmm. moved to me like after mm -hmm. they kind of gave a signal. And then mm -hmm. I could see out of the side of her head what she was dreaming about. Mm -hmm. And it was a tower that was blue and red and it had cracks all in it. Mm -hmm. And I could tell people kind of looking at me to see what I would do. And so what I did was I took out not literally, but like in this sense, I took out like this like bandage and mm -hmm. I wrapped the tower and I'd sent to her energy saying, you deserve peace, stability, and security. 
and I mm -hmm. gave her that energy. And then I pushed it, I pushed the dream back into her head, mm -hmm. right? And so for me, that was one of the most significant experiences of that, just how this whole, this different notion of reality could be something that lots of people could perceive at the same time. Mm -hmm. And that was one. The other was when I could hear the sound of the cosmos in the rainforest. Mm -hmm. And one of the shaman name is Yami. He asked me and yeah. I was like, yeah, yeah. I can hear, like I hear these sounds and it sounded like mm -hmm. the universe in the rainforest. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And he was like, that's Yahe. I was like, oh, okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I mean, there are other experiences that we can talk about, but I think those two are ones that are, I guess, easiest to kind of lay out there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. To kind of talk about, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, I do remember too that, um, in the time that we drank together, um, I was I was going through uh, you know an emotional situation that I had with some girlfriend that time, um, and and it was it was significant to me that uh, you saw me uh, during the ceremony, not only physically but you know in the other dimension where I because I was not close to you in the ceremony, I was in, in a different yeah, space. You were in another place, yeah. Yeah, I was in a different a different place. But uh I felt one time where I wanted to reach out for help and I went to you. Mm -hmm. uh, and 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 uh, it was it was significant that you didn't know all my all my you know my emotional stuff. You didn't know all of that but you knew how I felt and how I felt and, and, and you knew it through the ceremony. That was a very uh, powerful, <laughs> significant moment to me when you were like, well, you were like lonely in there. And I was like, what did you mean? The next day we talk about that. You remember yeah. that? Yeah, 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 yeah. No, I could see you very clearly. So like, so when you, <laughs> so you told me one time you had a drink, part of your vision, you were like a fish, like a half, dog, mm -hmm. half fish creature, something in the river was mm -hmm. positive. Mm -hmm. So for me, the animal that manifests was um, the jaguar, which is the main mm -hmm. spiritual animal. Mm -hmm. And I was in the jaguar moment and I, I, could, I looked at you and I could see mm -hmm. that you were a fish. Mm -hmm. and I, <laughs> it's really funny, but I bit you a little bit. I, don't know. <laughs> I, was like, I was like, he's a fish and I bit him, I bit you a little bit. But easy to catch. Yeah, I guess so, yeah. And um, <laughs> And I thought that was really funny, but I, I think it, it related to like, yeah, that there's a kind of awareness or connection that occurred. And I remember that moment when I just saw that you were like very, very lonely. And when you reached out to me, you were sitting on the chair, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. And I walked at that point, at that moment, in my vision, I had gone to from South America to Africa and mm -hmm. I was a lion. And I was really like feeling that experience of myself and I was walking and I walked past you and mm -hmm. I know the other shaman and his, his people were around you and I could mm -hmm. feel your energy like reach out to me. Mm -hmm. At that moment, I'm like, I'm lying, I'm trying to feel this. So I just walked past the wind sat <laughs> on like this, the, like this porch thing and like just looking into the, like into the rainforest and the horizon. Mm -hmm. And then eventually the two other shamans came, um, Razito and, um, the other one, not Yami. There's another guy. I don't remember his, his name, but they came yeah. and talk, they came and talked to me, and, and they really wanted to talk to me because clearly I was, mm -hmm. you know, I was, and it was nice. It was a certain kind of camaraderie, but mm -hmm. they, um, but I didn't really speak Spanish. But they told me to come back over to you, mm -hmm. and that's when I was like, yeah, and that's when I met you. I like held your hand, and I like mm -hmm. gave you like energy, the same kind of energy I gave mm -hmm. her. Yeah, that was mm -hmm. a really powerful moment for me too. You know, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, that way. No, yeah, that's those, and I think those kind of mom, those kind of you know, uh, pretty uh, contextual and particular ways of describing different ways uh, in which we approach to reality, and I think those are meaningful, and uh, and that's why I decided to put it into the book and describe it as the world of the spirit, because it's it, it is a relation because it's a very almost a religious kind of experience, but it's not only that uh, because it's also like you know. Um, with with uh, sharing with this with people and having this kind of uh, reconnection with your roots, with your ancestors. That's, I think, it's very powerful. That's why I call it the world of the spirit. 
because it, it, it makes you feel that you are not alone here. It makes you it makes you aware more than feeling. It makes you aware that you have a connection with the ancestors and they are still calling to you. And it's still calling to you to tell you uh, where or what kind of what kind of um, life do you want to follow. But definitely, it's a conversation with a different world, not like a, a higher or lower. But it's just uh, an awareness uh, of your connection with uh, the world of the ancestors. So, and that's also meaningful that you mentioned in here, uh, your way you how you connected with Africa, and you know and how you represented into into your own experience, and how I represent into my own experience. How this connection get together, and uh, probably uh, this is. Uh, this and also another that I haven't mentioned before, that how we relate, you know, Africa and South America, like one whole thing there together. Mm -hmm. Also very symbolic uh, representation in there. Yeah, because I, I do think there's a couple of things in relation to that. One, mm -hmm. based on what I what I experienced, I did see that, I mean, this, this, um, this capacity to journey, mm -hmm. however you want to call it, wherever you go, it's something that mm -hmm. is a part of what humans do. Mm -hmm. everywhere mm -hmm. and so mm -hmm. i think that's part when i went to africa and particularly i saw a location and then i saw a, a tree that had the line mm -hmm. at the trunk and then other animals coming out of it on the side and i turned into mm -hmm. other animals too and some of the other shamans could see what was going on as well mm -hmm. and so for me there's that connection but also what strands out most strongly to me is which is this capacity for healing mm -hmm. you know like i don't it's how that happens, right? I have ideas, but one of the one of them, I healed a dog at mm -hmm. the ceremony. It was really mm -hmm. like there was a dog that was like really itching, mm -hmm. and I could tell. And he was just around like a small dog, but like this big. Mm -hmm. And during the ceremony, at one point in the ceremony, he came in my lap, and I put mm -hmm. my hand on it, and I felt like this energy that was like kind of negative or agitated go into me, mm -hmm. and then by the end of the ceremony he was walking around he wasn't like agitated anymore mm -hmm, so like mm -hmm. there seems to be it's very interesting what is the link between this capacity to be in this state or to be in having these experiences and being able to share and transfer energy between mm -hmm. each other and the capacity for that to heal you there's no other better mm -hmm. word for it you know I, mm -hmm. I, there's a lot really to think about in relation to that mm -hmm. yeah about about healing there's um there's this sense where we normally um in our community say that uh when a person is sick uh probably his or her energies are not in harmony or in balance Mm -hmm. And this could, call, could could do for for different reasons, like you know, it could be physical um, kind of uh, you know unbalancing your spiritual life. It could it could also be just purely spiritual uh, that causes just this kind of imbalance. And the physical uh, kind of um, blocks could be easily repaired. But the more spiritual ones could cause more, da more damage. And so you have to have more uh, strong people, uh, I mean, spiritual strong people to heal you uh, if, if your issue is more spiritual, more deep. Um, and the people who normally have the capacity to heal uh, are people who have previously had some kind of connection with the spiritual world isn't it did it just not happen just randomly or it, that's because your preparation you know it has because that's that's why sometimes you know new age kind of people who say oh yes it's something spiritual and that's it no it, it's a different it's a different kind of world no, it's very it's very different yeah, it, it is not that, you, oh, I imagine I can kill you and I can kill you. No, it, it's just like uh, it has to do much more with uh, your capacity to understand other people and based on your capacity to understand other people's sufferings and, and based on your capacity to understand why they will feel that way, uh, you slowly start to understand that 
a lot of their sufferings, a lot of their difficulties, a lot of the, because people normally tell you how they feel, but if you share with a lot of time with them, and if you share uh, and, and you became much more interested uh, in knowing them uh, more carefully, probably you would have noticed um, why, why, why those people feel that way. And probably it, it gives you more understanding about how would you help them to uh, to rebalance, so to speak, uh, their energies, to reorganize their energies. And this is how I think the process of healing works. And this is why it's something, is a gift uh, from the uh, Yahya spirit that gives to you the, the, the capacity to, to go into a specific person with a specific need and see what's gonna, what, what you could do there. And not everybody has that kind of capacity. Yeah. One thing um, I wrote in terms of, for me, having that capacity is that, I don't know if I told you this, but um, maybe a few weeks ago, I was, you know, going through different kinds of things. And I felt that, maybe I told you, but I felt that Yahe is inside of me. Mm -hmm. I, remember, and I remember when I told you that I had that vision of going back in time to before the Big Bang into another universe. Mm -hmm. It was a giant wooden woman putting something mashed in the mouth, yellow in the mouth of a child. Mm -hmm. You told me, you said, I think, I mean, you said, I think Yahi revealed herself to you mm -hmm. like we were on the bus. And I didn't really know what that meant. <laughs> but, mm -hmm. but a few weeks, like maybe four, three or four weeks ago, I could feel that like in from my heart through my arm into my finger away from my pinky, there's like a line that's activated that is like, that is Yahi. Mm -hmm. I think that that's mm -hmm. like, there's a certain way that our bodies, and that's what, and that's one of the common themes of this book that I was waiting to the end to really bring up as we mm -hmm. kind of start to maneuver to closing this conversation mm -hmm. is transformation. Mm -hmm. right? I think mm -hmm. transformation comes up, it comes up in time and spirit, in time and, and, and beauty, but I think mm -hmm. it's most strongly in spirit. Mm -hmm. It seems like mm -hmm. spirit has something to do with understanding, awareness, and transformation. Mm -hmm. the capacity to change yourself the level of biology psychology and other mm -hmm. things like that so mm -hmm. that's one of the things i took away from but even the other notions of time and space storytelling you all mm -hmm. say storytelling is has a capacity mm -hmm. to transform and mm -hmm. skinate has a capacity to transform especially through mm -hmm. forgiveness in a new and a reappreciation or deep appreciation of the aesthetic quality of existence so mm -hmm. so yeah that's a very that's a really, uh, easy question. Tell me about transformation. Yeah, no, I, I, I think you described it quite accurately when you mentioned that all of, all of the dimensions that uh, we describe or I describe in the book have this capacity of transformation. The storytelling has the dimension that you wanted to transform yourself or transform the next generation of people with a story. That's a very powerful thinking, you know, saying that in your capacity, uh, it, it is uh, the power of transformation, your generation, by telling a story, by by telling a good story uh, from your in your own language, you could transform not only yourself but also other people's life with, with that uh, with that sense. I think also there is a, a powerful way of saying that um, the anxieties of a generation could be healed by uh, storytelling, by the act of telling a good story. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that's, that's in there, in the, in the transformation there. Also in the, in the, uh, the I think here, uh, the power of transformation works um, uh, when, you, when you experience the relationships or the kind of, uh, of, the, of the meaningful ways to relate with other people and with your environment. And um, normally, this is not something that we do every day. But when we dance, when we participate into the dancing, uh, your uh, life uh, changes, the quality of life changes, because you, you become part of the whole community. It is as if before you were some, some, somehow uh, a little bit detaching yourself from the community, going away from the unity of the community. Um, mm -hmm. And now when you, the, the, the dancing uh, gives you uh, the ability to go back to the 
to the to the unity of the community, the harmony of the community. So it, it is a power of transformation in there too. And the most meaningful one, of course, I agree with you, the transformation in the spiritual sense, because it, this is this only this works not only in the personal level, but it also works for the for the for the well-being of those surrounding you. Uh, but definitely it has to start with your capacity to transform yourself, to change yourself, to know what is really matters in, in life um, from this, uh, from this uh, a specific sense of developing your own intuition, your own capacity to understand your life, to grow as a person. That kind of power of transformation and healing yourself comes only with the ayahuasca, at least in, in my community. I know I'm not saying this, everybody has to do it. Probably there are other ways of doing it. But, uh, but in, in the community, uh, in our community, we have been doing it in that way. I probably, probably will change someday. Who knows? But at the moment, uh, the most meaningful experiences uh, had um, been related into the terms of, of time, beauty, and the spirit. And I wanted to take into account those, ex those experiences into a bigger context. And thank you, Alejandro. No, my thank brother. you. Thank you, brother. <laughs> no, yeah. thank you for, for your support, for making fun of me sometimes. I do appreciate <laughs> I tried, all of that. I tried during this conversation I, to make sure I, I got you, but I, I didn't do as good I, as other times. Yeah, yeah. No, thanks. Thanks a lot. Thank you. And thank you for everybody who's going to listen to it. And once again, the book is called A Decolonial Philosophy of Indigenous Colombia, Time, Beauty and Spirit in Kamsha Culture.